Okay, I think it is time to start. I'm uh, hi. I'm Chris. I'm I'm hosting this uh, track, the joy track, for the remainder of the day, and it's my pleasure to introduce Gregory. I think Gregory, we met first uh, at uh, in Philadelphia at any Scala, right? And yeah, uh, that's that's correct. And you told me about uh, your interest in geographic information systems, and you also have a very interesting blog post about like sensors on satellites on on your on your blog, which I found very nice. Um, also, you happen to have a diploma in type lambda calculus. Uh, this is correct, and this is uh, well, it's pretty like unusual, you know, <laughs> to hear from someone that someone discovered that information. Most important of all, however, it's your birthday today. Well, it was like technically yesterday, you know, like 17, but oh, yeah, see. it's today. <laughs> okay, so in any case, a belated happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so and, much. Uh, you're actually going to talk about a, a topic that, that, I, that I find very interesting as well, because picking up functional programming, we all learn about recursion, and very early on, many people probably struggle with recursion a little bit, and it's like early on, it has the rumor to be complicated. And then as you go later, you don't actually write recursions by hand very much. You often use like existing constructs like folds or other recursion schemes, which I hope you're going to tell us a lot about. So I'm handing over to you. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Chris. Oh, um, sorry. I forgot one thing. <laughs> um, please, anyone, ask questions using Zoom's Q&A feature at the bottom. And uh, did you say you want to take questions at the end or...? I think at the end is more preferable, but if there would be like some short questions, yeah, why not interrupt? Okay. Just play uh, by ear. All right, and you'll be available in the Q&A room after. Okay, sorry, now take it away. <laughs> all right, uh, all right. So I'm Grigory, Grigori, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, recursion schemes, uh, but not only about recursion schemes, but more about a path to recursion schemes. So the intention of this presentation uh, is not to describe recursion scheme in details and not to show some advanced recursion scheme techniques, but more to show the path that you can follow towards better recursion schemes understanding and towards the actual use of them. Um, but a couple of words about me. So I work as an open source uh, software engineer uh, in Xavier and well, Xavier it is a B corporation. So it applies some JS analysis software and research for positive social and environmental impact. And I'm really honored to work with my colleagues. So we are also helping to build a COVID care map. It is a small project that maps the US health system capacity needs. Uh, so because it is an open source project, you can contribute into it yourself. You can follow us on GitHub. Um, so if you're really interested somehow in this project and or need some help with uh, processing your data, you can write to us and pull this map. I will probably share a link after uh, the presentation. Um, yeah, so let's return back to myself. Um, I work as a GeoTrellis engineer and GeoTrellis is an open source, again, a geospatial processing engine. Um, it's written in Scala and it used to be only distributed engine. So but distributed means that it used Spark, some big tables and other, probably not very interesting for everyone things, but we're trying uh, to get rid of this and to be more abstract. And by talking about abstract, we are also, we were trying to use tagless final much before it became popular. So you can only imagine what a great code quality we have. So please check out our repositories. Um, and if you want to contribute, please do that. Um, all right, so that's enough about me. Let's return to the presentation. So um, recursion schemes, this is something that is usually mentioned in the context of building demand specific languages. Let's pretend for a second that we don't know what is a recursion scheme, what are recursion schemes. But we definitely know that it is something that is usually mentioned in blog posts uh, to deal with DSLs. And, uh, but normally, we don't need any recursion schemes to work with DSLs uh, when we are in Java or in Python and we would like to build some domain-specific language. I don't think that everyone knows and uses recursion schemes um, and the term recursion scheme itself. And typically, when we find any blog post about recursion scheme, it is usually about uh, building a calculator or uh, building some DSL that would be about constructing uh, some arithmetic expressions. So what is a DSL? So DSL is a computer language. 
specialized to a particular application domain. And um, let's have a small exercise. Let's try to define our own DSL that would be absolutely arbitrary, but by arbitrary with a star, because I will be specifying this domain uh, and uh, the language. Um, yeah, but let's try to define our own DSL. Let's try to define it without recursion schemes. And let's find this point of recursion scheme applications. At what point we would like to use them and why we don't need them normally. Uh, so, um, so because I'm a geospatial engineer, I would like to introduce you some different from a calculator domain that is a geospatial domain. And we will talk about rasters. And rasters are usually um, delivered, hold on, um, delivered as some raster, as, as some scenes from satellites. And they delivered in various of formats uh, in different shapes, uh, if, you, if we may say so. For instance, this is um, an example of an open source um, storage of Landsat imagery. So Landsat 8 is just a satellite that takes pictures of a nerve and it delivers data in this various of formats and in different uh, various of shapes. For instance, in this case, we see that all bands are delivered separately in some format that is called TIFF. They are around 60 or 70 megabytes. So just imagine to build up an RGB raster, you will have to compose at least three bands and it will be around 200 megabytes. And just to give you the sense of how large these thrusters are, this is like, you know, a Yosemite Landsat um, scene that goes from Santa Cruz to almost Sacramento and shows something. So it's like a really huge piece of data. And as you may have guessed, this data is usually unnormalized and it's very hard to work with such, um, well, comparably large pieces of data. Uh, but I said specifically that it is a data delivered by Landsat satellite. If you don't know what is Landsat, it's just like some random satellite. But there are any uh, there are lots of other satellites. For instance, MODIS. It also delivers um, data that is greeted, greeted differently, and it delivers it in this. You see, um, these are not rectangles. This is something different. And this uh, modest scenes, they cover even larger areas and it cover, covers like a third or fourth part of the continent here. And it's like, you see something really huge and large. So a part of delivering this Landsat imagery, it comes not only with raster data, some pictures with, that we can visualize, it also comes with something that is called extend or bounding box coordinates. So that's how we can figure out uh, where on a map to put um, our scene or satellite or whatever. So why I'm talking about that? Because this is like a large chunk of, a large, large piece of data. So um, if we were to turn back to our Lensat, uh, Lensat tile or Lensat scene, um, so how to work with that? Usually just special engineers work with that by chunking it and splitting it into some other grid rather than from the grid that is, um, rather on through the satellite grid. So if we will zoom in significantly enough, probably we will notice that all the data is chunked. Well, probably you don't see because of the Twitch quality or zoom quality, but if we will try to go to the left or up or to the right, we can see that the map gets preloaded into this, uh, by these small square chunks, chunked by 200, well, sliced by 256 by 256 small chips or 512 by 512, it depends on the standards. So this thing that we see here, it's used in all uh, map viewers, like in Google Maps or Mapbox. And this small chip is usually called a tile. Let's return back to the slide. So right now we figure out what is a tile. So we'll call a tile just a small chip of a scene that is somehow get extracted from um, the satellite imagery uh, we'll call extend a bounding box of a tile. So this would be just bounding box coordinates of a tile in whatever projection. So if you have a question, what is projection? I will be happy to answer about it later, but let's say that we know what is projection. So this is like extend a bounding box delivered in let longs. And we'll call raster just a tuple of uh, tile and extend. And what problem our language can resolve or what problem we can resolve in this domain. It's how to query a catalog of rasters by extent intersection coverage and so on. 
because even here when we're moving back in fact we're doing a query like server please give me uh, all tiles that intersect the area of interest i'm looking into so this would be like a simple task and a catalog of raster is just a list of rasters a list of these tuples all right mm. let's continue so uh, this is a small visualization of how it may work of how we can use this language for instance, we would like to query all tiles that intersect a Salt Lake City gray bounding box and intersect this Las Vegas area and this gray tile that intersects Phoenix area. Or we would like to query whatever uh, is covered by this gray bounding box on the right that covers Denver a little bit. We'll talk about it later a little bit in details on how this can be implemented in Scala. So, and to implement this, we need to implement it in terms of Scala language. And we will start by implementing a domain. And well, let's say that domain uh, consists of extent. And as already mentioned, extent is this are just bounded box of a tile. And these are just doubles, uh, coordinates. Um, we'll say the tile is just an array of bytes and we're not interested in tile at all because uh, we won't use it. Well, we can or will use it, but we don't need it. Uh, and type raster would be a tuple of tile and extent, just to know what we're talking about. The next step after defining a domain, it's uh, defining the language itself. Let's define a parent trait. Uh, we'll call it query, because I already mentioned this logical nodes that can be present in the query. Let's create and and or logical nodes. And what is interesting in them? Uh, the main interest here is that they are recursive nodes uh, because they have left and right nodes and they contain the type that is basically can be again and or whatever whatever children of a query. Uh, we will also have um, the real node that performs actual computations. This would be a leaf of the expression that just intersects. So basically here will have all the magic. I don't want to cover other possible nodes like coverage or um, inclusion or whatever because extended is a geometry. So there are a bunch of operations we can imagine um, that can work with extent or with geometries. Let's fulfill the DSL with some bottom nodes. Uh, these are empty nodes. One would be all, which will stand for um, retrieve everything from the catalog. I don't want to apply any filters. And empty will return nothing from the catalog. And about application, uh, the usage example will look like this. So we're just basically building uh, a set of nested case classes like here. Obviously by using some scholar powers, we can introduce some uh, smart constructors, some implicit methods so we can build up, we can convert it into something more beautiful for someone. Um, but Let's go further. Um, let's jump back to the picture I showed you in the beginning of the presentation. And this is, these are like these circles that and it's a red circle, it stands for the and logical operation and fat and I just decided to, you know, to split out somehow these facts I'm giving to you, throwing it into you. So let's see how we can implement uh, the query displayed in a picture uh, by writing it in Scala. So here, the first logical node this would be like this fat end circle. And this extent would be, um, I think it would be this Las Vegas gray box, gray bounding box. So the query, this node will tell us that we need to have an intersection of these. The tiles should intersect this bounding box and this bounding box on the bottom that covers phonics. The next end logical node will contain um, all the results from the bottom node and the top it should also include and satisfy the condition that it, the tile should also intersect like the Salt Lake City area and the entire query the like the main node like the first node um, that unifies uh, everything here it is the or node and this is like this blue circle well probably I'm not the best in painting uh, stuff but this thing will cover the Denver area so these are all uh, valid coordinates. So you can check it out yourself and try to implement it yourself and visualize it. So this is a real query. And this, uh, the output of this query would be a set of rasters, a catalog of tiles, uh, a list of tiles that covers 
these two red circles or it gets the um, tiles that cover this uh, Denver area. All right, um, so what's the deal here? How to interpret the language we designed it? So we, we implemented it, uh, we know what is the domain, we know uh, the DSL itself, how to interpret it. The easiest interpreter we can think of is just by traversing through the structure recursively and converting everything into a stream, right? Um, and by going deeper, so how it works, how this function works. For instance, we start a node with an end expression. It will find a node end pattern match on that and we'll say, all right, I want to go deeper and it will apply the evolution function onto the next step of an expression. That's how it works. And we'll go down until it will find some node that cannot go deeper. It will find a leaf. In our case, this would be intersect all and empty. Uh, all right, I guess it's pretty clear so far. Uh, but the original task was not to print a string from a query, but it was more about how to filter the catalog of input clusters. So this query can be interpreted into a function and the result of the query evaluation can be a filter function that just knows how to filter the input list of rosters. It works basically the same way. It finds the first logical node, the first recursive node, as I want, I'd like to tell it, to call it this way here. And it will try to go deeper and will try to apply the same evaluation function to all the children nodes. And actually, in the intersection area, the real computation happens. It just filters the input list of rasters by the extent, by intersection, whatever this function means. All definitely returns an identity. So it just means that it's no op. We will return whatever was in the catalog. And empty always returns nil. All right. Um, I hope we're in a good shape still. So what do we have common in these two language interpreters? Because you may have a question. Uh, why, uh, why try, during trying to resolve the problem of uh, filtering the list, I decided to implement uh, an, a string evaluator that converts a query into a string. The similarity. So these two functions, uh, the common thing that they have this is self-references, they're recursive. And these two functions look very, very, very similar, uh, right? And when there is similarity in functional world or in any math world, we can think of a generalization. Let's pretend that um, a function uh, exists with uh, such type signature that it can accept as an argument some function that knows how to evaluate each node of an expression tree and as a second argument, it accepts the entire tree. So this function should know just how to traverse uh, through the tree and how to apply F to all the nodes, how to evaluate each node. This sounds very much like a description of a fold wide. And basically this is like a spoiler because like I prepared this presentation. So I was going to tell you that it is a fold wide. So yes, so this sounds very much like a fold wide. We would like to fold a query using some function that knows how to fold each node. So, but because it's a fold function, it knows how to traverse through the expression tree. So it turned out that generalized functions to traverse through nested structures are called recursion schemes. And that is all, this is the, all, the whole mystery. So the whole idea of the recursion schemes was to factor recursion out. It was to abstract all the recursion. And so you don't need to implement the same evaluation function every time. So why is that so? Because probably you may want to traverse through your structure more than using a single function. There is no, not a single eval function exists. You can traverse through the structure in various ways um, using like a bunch of methods in a bunch of ways you want. So because we need to factor recursion out, um, let's start with factoring recursion out from the DSL uh, and here, what we can do with that is to introduce a type parameter. Right, um, sounds not very good. But by introducing type parameter, we are kind of saying to the compiler that, hey, our nodes are not recursive anymore. This is technically type parameter that can mean everything. And we don't have explicit self-references. Uh, let's leave with it for now as it is. So let's pretend that it is totally fine. But I would say that 
because for us, it means that everything can be in this A type parameter. For the compiler, it means absolutely the same. It feels that it can put whatever, because the user can put whatever he wants here, she wants here. Um, that's, uh, that can be confusing a little bit. Let's try to use this um, query, let's DSL that we've implemented. And from the first look, it is obviously similar and absolutely similar to what we have on the left. Like uh, the language looks very similar. So what's the deal here? What's the problem? Let's try to implement something different because before I was always showing you the same query, but what if we will have lots of queries? They can be different. Like this is like the first example of a query. This one is a primitive intersex query. So what happened here? By introducing the type parameter, we also introduced obviously complexity into our code base. We also made it hard for the compiler to work with these types. So it turned out that type of expressions depends on the tree shape on the nodes that we put into the tree. And if we will look into the left here, it does not matter how many uh, tree, uh, how many nodes we'll put into the tree. What are the nodes would be? It always can derive the type. But here, because we kind of were trying to be smart, we kind of spoiled everything. So we, what to do with that? Uh, I already told you that we introduced some extra complexity and this type parameter for us means everything. It turned out that it is not. So here comes a fixed point type. I made this slide intentionally look very ugly so you can't parse it. But the fixed point type, the fixed point type can help us to fix the types of our expressions so fixed point of a function f is just such x that f in this x equals to x. We can bring absolutely the same up to the type level. So I won't read it again because it would be absolutely the same. Um, but, and we will call the fix just a function that computes a fixed point for the input f. So the rule that fix of f equals to f of fix will work. All right, so you may probably have a question, how does that help us and how to work with this? Um, I still don't have an answer for you, but let's try to implement it somehow straightforward in Scala terms. Let's define a case class that will look this way. So what can we tell about the fixed case class at this point? Uh, the, those people who know, uh, they can probably tell us that, well, fix will be a denotion that it is a recursion and they will be right. So how would fixed point type work if we will define it this naive way? Let's try to apply it to the all nodes that we have. If we will wrap all nodes of the query expression into the fixed point type, elegantly, um, the fixed point type will help compiler to know what the type of the expression would be. So we just wrapped all nodes into the fixed point type. Yeah, it's ugly, but by the end of the day, we have the good output type and all queries do they have a different shape and they are all very complicated because they have a type parameter, they have the same type. Isn't this cool? So this is the idea of a fixed point. So fixed point is just a denotion for the compiler that abstract type F, whatever it is, it is a recursion type. So let's return back to the fold write function. Uh, originally we wanted it to, or I wanted it, to look this way, so like this full write function that accepts a function that knows how to work with a query and that accepts uh, the tree that it wants to traverse and evaluate. Because we introduced a new, more complicated query with a type parameter, let's replace it by it. So uh, that's how it looks now. However, do we really need to know something about query app except it is recursive? So because I already told you that fixed point is just a denotion for the compiler to tell it that the type is recursive, we can replace it by F and replace the query by fixed point um, type here. So the only thing we need to know right now that this structure is recursive and we have some function that knows how to um, fold a node and evaluate the node. It turned out that this fancy function is called algebra in smart terms. And so algebra would be just a function that knows how to evaluate, how to fold each node. So just like a function that knows what to do with the node. 
if we will rewrite it in regular terms of, uh, we will replace types here. So that's how the final signature of the fold write and how it would look like. So it turned out that it's the first morphism and the first recursion scheme we've met today is called catamorphism. And catamorphisms is, catamorphism is turned out to be just a fancy word for a fold write function. Let's try to implement it. So because this function should traverse over the nodes and apply fold function to each node, it should know how to probably map over the structure because we have F. So we can traverse through everything, just knowing how to map all the nodes of a tree. But we can do that because we have a fixed point type as an input and we know nothing about a fixed point type. So fix here by definition, fix of F equals to F of fix but compiler does not know anything about it. And we don't know anything about it because in terms of how we define the case class, um, fix, it is just a fix. And it, we know nothing about that. So from the definition of the fixed point type and from the implementation, what we gave here, it's, uh, we can manually prove to the compiler to tell him that, that, all right, to tell it that fix of F equals to F of fix. So what does that mean for us? It means for us, if we know how to traverse through the structure, through our the query f DSL that we've implemented before, if we'll define a functor over that for it, uh, we will know how to traverse over the structure. And this is the hack, this is the trick. So how this function works finally, let's pretend that we have this query from the beginning of the presentation and let's say that we're facing a node end and the query begins from the end node wrapped into fix. So at this point, during the map step, we will be mapping over the, the tree. And what functor here will tell? It will tell, all right, let's pass the same fold function to the children that we have here. So it will go deep until it will find some value nodes like intersection or empty or all whatever that does not go deeper. That's how it works. Let's check out what changed in our language interpretation. If we'll look into the right and to the left, what's the difference here? Right, we got rid of an explicit recursion. And this is pretty nice. So we can define right now uh, the interpreter by just defining a function. Well, this is like a partial function that knows how to work with all the nodes without defining an explicit recursion. And the usage would look absolutely or not absolutely, but pretty, pretty much like it was before, except we have this ugly fixed type everywhere, right? And we will use catamorphism to work for the tree and to apply algebras to every node of a tree. And that's how we fold it. All right, we have a nice talk about, we had nice talks about monads. And when there is a question about monad, there is a question about co-monad. And when there is a question about fold right, there is a question about unfold. We made an overcomplicated fold ride called catamorphism, which how to build up a structure that is wrapped into some fix, whatever it is. Um, I don't want to go through the same implications we've done for the fold ride, but just believe me that it's the signature of, um, uh, of the unfold function. And this function here is called algebra. So basically this is the entire implementation of the unfold. I will repeat myself that you can follow through similar steps um, um, to, that I've done and through the same implications I've done to draft the full write. Um, but so yeah, so the thing here is that this function that knows how to build up a structure from a given value is called algebra. And it's again, another fancy world, uh, word. So this is a generator function that knows how to build up things. And this unfold is the second recursion scheme we've met today. It's called anamorphism. And that is basically all. So just folds and unfolds in the recursion scheme world, they exist together. They call by smart things and smart uh, words. Um, uh, that is probably a little bit scary. So let's continue. How to use all this stuff? So we defined a query f. So what's, uh, what's the usual problem we can try to solve with having a, an expression in DSL? We would probably like to convert it into JSON or to build it up from a JSON, let's define an algebra and coalgebra types. And coalgebra and algebra would convert the, the tree into a JSON. And coalgebra will build it up from a JSON. 
so sorcery is smart enough so it can derive codex for the nodes, but it cannot derive for something that is wrapped into some fixed point type. Even we don't know what's that. Uh, yes. Excuse me, uh, Gregory, just for a second. I, uh, we're time wise, we're like at the end of the talk now. I think it's fine if we run five minutes over, just giving you a heads up. Yep, I'm, I'm tracking it. Yeah, I will be quick. Sorry for that, guys. So, and coalgebra would stand for building up a structure from query. We need algebra just because we will traverse through all the nodes and we'll apply this rule to every node and build up a JSON this way. And this would be an application of catamorphism here. Coalgebra will build up a structure. So we can be a little bit tricky here. And I skipped a bunch of methods from the source syntax. But what we know about that, that every node was converted into a JSON object. So we can traverse through JSON because it turned out that JSON is also a recursive structure. And we can convert every node into some uh, expression into a case class here using source capabilities. And from JSON would be just anamorphism. And by providing a algebra here, we can build up a structure. So what's the deal here? Let's try to use that. Let's pass into the as JSON, um, just a main input query from the beginning of the presentation. And it will be derived, it will be converted into this beautiful JSON string. We can also build up this string from JSON into uh, some real query, and you can compare it yourself. It would look absolutely the same way it looked um, a couple of slides before. So um, yeah, so what is, what's cool about that? So we can compose catamorphism and anamorphism, anamorphism, right? I'm doing a wrong accent here. So um, if we have a JSON, it's a pretty natural uh, desire to evaluate the JSON itself. And we can do that by composing two functions, Anna to build up a structure from a given JSON and Kata to fold it from a JSON, uh, from a query that was built from a JSON. And this is still nice. If we look into the left, we can do that and we can pass Anna into Kata directly. But uh, the problem with that is that we will traverse through the same tree two times and we call a short circuit here by applying algebra and algebra during the same map step. And this nice thing called holomorphism, I don't want to go into details about how, how to use holomorphism, but you can use it, for instance, to evaluate a JSON and it will convert JSON into some query and evaluate query and will convert it to for instance, a function that knows how to filter a list of rosters, like, like the task from the beginning of this presentation, and it will do it in a single step. So what are the benefits of this approach? Uh, well, benefits are for sure that you're getting a uh, arguably purer uh, code, and you don't have to use explicit recursions. You have like access to this bunch of recursion, uh, recursions available. I, I've stolen this, um, picture from the Matryoshka repository. And there are libraries like Matryoshka and Drossi, they implement all these recursion schemes for you. And because right now you know that recursion schemes are just like ways how you can traverse over the structure, you're not scared of it anymore. So please look into that. Um, what can be interesting here, for instance, histomorphism. You can get previous answers it has given. Probably anyone, everyone could have faced such a situation that you wanted to have uh, some results from the previous step of your recursive evaluation, uh, from the previous step of your recursive evaluation. What are the problems? The barrier to entry is really high and you're getting this fixed type um, in all expressions for free. For sure you can hide it somewhere deep in your prop, uh, program, but still once in a while someone will break the compiler, this fixed point type will appear. What to do? You will have to explain whatever I explained to you right now. So let's summarize it if someone didn't watch this presentation. So recursion schemes are just generalized functions to traverse through nested structures. It is just a powerful tool to help to, help to work with nested data structures. And there is more than a single way to traverse uh, recursion um, structures. So, and you probably learned it right now and you do, don't need to invent this algorithm. Everything was implemented. But the cost of this is the barrier to entry. I also um, created a, sub, a project that supports this presentation. It has everything that is implemented here. Uh, it consists of three packages. The first contains a DSL implementation without recursion scheme usage. The second contains the DSL implementation with our own recursion schemes defined with our own Keta and Anna. And the third 
or implements everything with using with relying on Drosty. So and yes, for sure, use Drosty is a fancy library that supports cats. It implements all these beautiful recursion schemes that can bring more purity into your code and into the project. I was also inspired by this recursion schemes introduction uh, blog post by Oli. It shows that you can use recursion schemes not only for calculators. Um, yeah. So follow me up on GitHub, Twitter, email. I will be very happy to answer all your questions. Uh, thanks for listening and thanks for coming to this conference.